Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm honored to be here today and I want to thank uh, Prof. Lam for the kind invitation. Um, today I will share a, a brief overview from my upcoming chapter, uh, Reimagining Sudan's Built Environment, a Sustainable Recovery Approach, uh, which will be published in the last book, From War to Sustainable Development, Rebuilding Sudan After the War. Before developing any recovery ideas, uh, understanding the scale of loss is a critical starting point. Uh, so this short video shows examples of Sudan's built environment before and after the destruction. Voice in the video, Sarah. Very slow uh, voice now. ايوه اوكي لانه لو, لو ما عملت شير للفويس ما بيسهرني انا هنا What we have just seen um, is a reminder that we have lost not only buildings, but homes, uh, lives, and the, the fabric of entire communities. Over 65% uh, percent of urban infrastructure in conflict zones needs major rehabilitation. Uh, around 14 million people have been displaced. Also critical heritage sites have been damaged. So uh, recovery must begin with a full understanding of what's broken and what must be rebuilt. Rebuilding is usually framed in uh, numbers, square meters, costs, and deadlines. But I ask, what are we really rebuilding? Is it homes or hub, infrastructure or identity, uh, public space or peace? Actually, these questions uh, shape my research and the recovery model I propose. If we don't uh, de define what we are rebuilding, we risk repeating the same mistake which brings us to the next question. What went wrong before? In the past years, uh, Sudan has seen many urban improvements efforts, uh, especially in Khartoum, the capital city. But they were um, often uh, top-down, rushed, and disconnected from the needs, besides uh, the imported designs which ignored climate and cultural identity. Sustainability, equity, and local input were missing, and the results didn't last. Let me give you a very real example the Greater Nile Petroleum uh, Tower, which is located in Khartoum, uh, the capital city of Sudan. It's located exactly in Al Mugran, central business district. It cost $92 million and featured uh, panoramic views of the Blue Nile and the White Nile. Uh, White Nile. It became uh, a powerful symbol of Khartoum's economic aspirations uh, during the oil boom. It was once uh, seen as a symbol of progress and modernity, but unfortunately, it's also a symbol of misplaced priorities. It was built with uh, imported materials and no environmental adaptations. It's fully glazed facade, large shading or passive cooling, making it poorly suited for Khartoum's harsh climate. Also, the building itself has little architectural value. It reflects uh, an imported model that failed to respond to Sudan's local context. Um, more importantly, uh, the tower was built on site with a very deep social and historical value, a place that should have stayed open and shared with community. Actually, this building reflects a deeper issue, the lack of planning, regulations, uh, architectural uh, guidelines, and oversight, which has led to 
chaotic development, uh, development across Sudanese cities. Um, currently, uh, the tower was destroyed during uh, the war, raising urgent question. Should we retrofit uh, damaged modern icons like this or rebuild with better alignment uh, to Sudan's context? So uh, to explore this, I studied uh, seven buildings and asked uh, seven experts to assess each one's design, um, environmental performance, and potential for retrofitting or reconstruction. The analysis, including detailed assessments and recommendations, can be found in the chapter. My research uh, approach is grounded, critical, and future-focused. I used uh, a multidisciplinary method, seven building case studies, seven expert interviews, policy reviews, and global best practices. Also, the framework uh, aligns with, with uh, sustainable development goals and building back better principles. Uh, I didn't just critic. I listened, uh, I questioned, and I built a framework grounded in Sudan's reality. That framework is the Sustainable Rebuilding and Recovery Framework, or SRRF. Uh, the SRRF addresses uh, the challenges of rebuilding Sudan's built environment after conflict and is designed to align with the country's environmental, cultural, and economic realities. Also, it aims to avoid past mistakes while providing a model that can be ad uh, adapted to similar recovery efforts, regionally and globally. Also, uh, the framework emphasizes six interconnected pillars. This infographic shows uh, the pillars, their sub-themes, and how they align with the sustainable development goals. Also, these are not isolated ideas. Uh, they work together to support uh, a just and lasting recovery. The six, uh, the six pillars are environmental and climate resilience, sustainable mobility, resilient health and well-being, efficient resource utilization, social and economic recovery, and heritage preservation. Due to time limits, I will briefly focus on <clears throat> just two pillars today. Each pillar structured around the sub-theme, its intent, key strategies, uh, Sudan-specific context, and alignment with the SDGs. The first pillar is efficient resource utilization, which is a very critical uh, in a context of energy shortages, uh, rising, uh, rising costs, and environmental pressure. Um, it includes uh, five sub-themes, uh, sustainable materials, energy efficiency and renewables, water management, waste reduction, and local and green supply chain. In Sudan, we highly depend on costly imports, uh, despite the abundance of reusable world debris. So we need to reduce waste by using life cycle assessments, uh, repurposing uh, debris, and adopting local uh, and climate-friendly materials like adobe and medium pots. At the same time, uh, temperatures in Sudan uh, reach 47 uh, degrees Celsius, making air conditioning essential for achieving thermal comfort for occupants, which increases energy consumption. On the other hand, uh, Khartoum consumes 70% of the nation's electricity and still faces 14% uh, shortages. Fuel scarcity and blackouts have forced many uh, people to rely on polluting diesel generators. That's why reducing energy use in Sudan is both an environmental and equity issue. So uh, we promote a fabric first approach, improve uh, insulation, air tightness, and shading before adding any mechanical systems. Meanwhile, uh, reviving a passive design from traditional Sudanese architecture like courtyards and thick walls. Um, another point is access to clean water, which remains very limited in Sudan, and climate stress is worsening. So strategies like rainwater harvesting, uh, grey water reuse, and condensate recovery can help conserve and, ma and, and manage water more sustainably. Waste is also a growing problem in Sudan, with no formal system in place. 
that's why solutions uh, include recycling, reconstruction, waste, converting organic waste into energy, and tapping into underused resources like agricultural uh, demolition debris. And finally, uh, high transport uh, costs and low manufacturing capacity are slowing uh, recovery. So stronger uh, local supply chains uh, can cut emissions, improve resilience, and accelerate progress. This pillar uh, linked to uh, SDG 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, and 13. The second pillar is heritage preservation. Um, the, the world already has destroyed uh, key sites in, uh, like uh, the Khartoum Presidential Palace and ancient uh, Nubian landmarks while looting has cut us uh, irreplaceable artifacts. So we need emergency documentation, like uh, using satellite imagery, uh, mapping tools, and disk assessments to protect what remains, besides uh, collaboration with groups like Interpol to recover st uh, stolen heritage. As many historic buildings are damaged, uh, we have a very lack of skilled professionals. So the restoration will require both local training and international support. Another point is uh, as cities expand, traditional Nubian and Islamic architecture is disappearing. So planning must reflect uh, local identity through heritage sensitive zoning and design. Uh, finally, uh, the war uh, has also disconnected communities from their heritage. So we must rebuild those ties through uh, education, uh, cultural tourism and community led efforts. This pillar uh, linked to SDG 4, 8, 11, 13, and 16. Heritage recovery uh, in Sudan can learn from past success, like UNESCO's uh, 1960s campaign to save Nubian monuments from flooding due to the Aswan High Dam. Over 50 countries uh, joined, uh, raising uh, $80 million to relocate uh, templates and preserve heritage, which de uh, demonstrate the power, uh, the power of global uh, cultural solidarity. Today, Sudan's uh, risks are even greater, and this time we can't wait. UNESCO and others must act now not just with funds, but with political will to say Sudan's heritage matters, Africa's heritage matters. But the question is, as global priorities shift, will heritage preservation still come under attention of policymakers and funders? A framework alone uh, doesn't rebuild the country. Recovery takes uh, collaboration. Uh, that's why in Sudan, the four key groups are policymakers and planners, architects and engineers, international organizations, uh, local communities as co-creators, not just beneficiaries. Now let's look ahead. What could Sudan look like in 2050 if recovery is done right? We envision climate resilient uh, cities powered by uh, solar microgrids, eco-friendly public uh, transport, connecting people and places, infrastructure that blends uh, both modern design with Sudanese heritage, um, a diversified green economy built on regenerative ag agriculture, tech uh, innovation and sustainable industry. We see also uh, thriving cultural tourism, uh, revived heritage and jobs that empower local communities to live their own future. Actually, this vision isn't a uh, fantasy. It's a future within which if Sudan makes bold, uh, locally grounded choices today, it could become Africa's leading model of sustainable post-conflict recovery by 2050. In the end, uh, rebuilding Sudan is not just a technical project. It's a cultural uh, and ethical one. We are shaping, uh, shaping not just uh, roads and walls, but memory, belonging, and a more resilient future. I hope this chapter offers a starting point for a conversation, a reflection, and a recovery that finally puts people first. Thank you. <laughs>